capitalist show, a good buddy of mine. He is the foremost expert on real estate investing in the United States. He needs no introduction whatsoever. You all know him. His name is Jason Hartman. Jason, welcome back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. George, it's great to be here. And there is so much stuff going on in the real yeah. estate market, in the housing market, in the economy. You know how And a lot of stuff is, is shocking. It is I mean, shocking. It, it, yeah. you were telling me some stuff before we started recording, and I was completely blown away. I haven't spent much time in the U.S. lately, but let's dive right into it. I know you've got some slides and everything. I just want to kind of hand the baton over to you. And if we could just go over kind of uh, on, at a macro level, what's happening with the United States real estate market, maybe from a standpoint of a potential investor, and then maybe for someone just kind of the average Joe who wants to get a lay of the land, if they're maybe thinking about buying or selling right now, yeah. um, I'll just let you take it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really going to depend, you know, where you live, uh, yeah. what the value of your home is, uh, and... Uh, it's just a lot of things. It's, it's a lot very, of the urban versus suburban yeah. rural thing here. That, that's yeah. what I've been hearing a lot of it's lately. Huge. It's huge. And as you know, uh, I was, I believe, uh, the first person to really predict that in February, which, you know, in, in, in uh, Cervasa sickness years is like, you know, seven years ago. <laughs> it's like dog years, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, time is very distorted in a in a in a pandemic. You know, it really. Yeah, but you called that. I I mean, I know I don't know if it was on one of our shows or just you and I talking back and forth, but okay. I remember you 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 definitely called that for sure. Yeah, I I, I just think the cities have really been losing their luster for a while, uh, and I originally said that back in 2012 because George. I thought that the self-driving car would really be the game changer. And of yeah. course, that, that hasn't really come yet, but we all know it's coming. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it'll be 2025. I'm not sure. And I came out with a quote back then eight years ago that said, geography is less meaningful than it's ever been in human history. Now, it still is meaningful. I don't mean to dismiss it. Of course, location matters, but not as much as it used to matter. You know, it used to be, location, 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 the three rules of real estate, right? And that mattered when we were living in caves. Uh, it, it matters now, but it just matters less than before. And, and there are all these but, things. But it, uh, it depends great. on what locations you're talking about, because yeah. just broad strokes, for, I think that, you know, urban people are looking at that and saying, man, do I really want to get stuck in this high rise apartment building when I can't leave? And then, so, yeah you know, do I want to go out to the suburbs? Do I want to get into a more rural area where I've got some more space? We might see kind of a migration. And um, so maybe it is about that type of location, but maybe right. not the specific uh, yeah. uh, location, location, location we talked about for the last however many years. Very, very good point. And so I guess I'm saying that against the backdrop of what people have always considered to be the best locations. New York right. City, uh, LA, you know, all of these uh, sort of trophy places, which I don't think LA is a trophy place at all. I, I grew up there and it's, a, to use Donald Trump's phrase, it's becoming a shithole, sadly. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you can read that if you like, but it's just a reality. Um, you know, California is just, it's turning into an absolute banana republic. It, it's absolutely yeah. sad what's going on there. And uh, New York is the same way. Um, you know, you see de Blasio freaking out that everybody has left the city in New York. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think this trend is going to switch back in any major way. I think the trend is to leave the high density locations. And um, every, since everybody, you know, you know, I have friends in, in New York City, as, as do you, uh, living in 600 square foot uh, apartments that they pay $3,800 to $4,200 a month for, you know, mm. 600 square feet. And, you know, they work on Wall Street, they work at Goldman Sachs, they work at whatever, right? And they're, they've been told to work at home the last several months. Well, does it matter if you're in Manhattan or if you're, you know, a thousand miles away or you're in, does it, could you just do as well do your work in Florida and right. have a much lower cost of living and a much nicer big suburban house and a beach and better weather and no state income taxes? I mean, th th these, these government people, have really got to rethink their offerings. And, you know, as 
as uh, consumers, if you will, of government, because in a way we are consumers and we get yeah. to vote with our feet. And so, you know, governments had really better rethink their offerings because the offerings offered by the Socialist Republic of California and the Socialist Republic of New York have really just diminished in value. So, you know, well, now they, they with problems. California, with that retroactive tax that you text me the other day, I yeah. mean, my goodness, I think everyone that lives in one of these states like Illinois or New Jersey or New York, if I was living in that type of state, I would look at California and I would say, whoa, 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 yeah. whoa. My state could be next. I need to pull the ripcord on this thing as fast as I can and, and get the heck out of here. But do you want to outline that, that tax? I don't know if it's proposed or if it's, yeah. it's law now, just for some of the people who might not have heard about that. It is just proposed. California has a few disasters uh, that are literally, um, they're on the table and they could definitely happen. Number one, repeal Prop 13. Back in 1978, uh, the brilliant Howard Jarvis uh, created Prop 13, which I think really allowed the California real estate market to flourish for many years. Yeah. Uh, because with Prop 13, it said that the state cannot charge more than 1% of the assessed value in property taxes. And it had all sorts of other provisions that, you know, like older people could sort of stick around in their house and their house could go way up in value, but they, they could only raise it a small amount over the years. And mm -hmm. And, and if, if that is untethered, look at it like Nixon closing the gold window in 1971, okay? Right. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very problematic for the state and, and chase a lot of people out. So that's one thing. Where do you think property taxes would go? Just out of curiosity. To the, to the infinity and beyond. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, listen, you know, one of the things I really realized in about uh, maybe 2008 or so living in California all of my life almost is that, you know, I was talking to a taxi driver who was driving me somewhere when I lived in Newport beach. And he was saying that he got a speeding ticket, George, and that speeding ticket turned into, I, I think he like paid it late, but you know, yeah, yeah. and, and, and they, but you know, look, it turned into a, a $1,000 ticket. Wow. And, and, you know, what that makes us realize is these are all sorts of non-tax revenue. They're not actual taxes, but they are taxes in a, in a different yeah. way. Yeah. And when you get a state or any government, any municipality that is broke, they become desperate. They become predatory on their citizens. Mm -hmm. And you just don't want to live in a place like that. You know, New York, California... Uh, you know, Illinois, you know, these are places that are becoming very predatory. The California's taxing agency, the FTB or Franchise Tax Board, is one of the most vicious, aggressive taxing agencies in the country. It, right. It's absolutely incredible how far they will reach and how they've been building this economic Berlin Wall around yeah. their state to keep people from taking their money out. And, and, and so yeah, and talk about that tax that, that you were yeah. texting me about, that retroactive deal. Yeah, well, um, you know, I've got a, a slide on that, actually, that, that might be uh, very telling. So let's go through a couple of things here, George, because I, I think your your viewers will really be interested. In yeah, and how this, and let's take this back to real estate really quick here. Yeah. And I, so if you're an investor, I mean, these are the things that you need to be cognizant of. If you're right. someone who's potentially thinking about buying or renting, this is something that you need to be aware of. So if you are if you have to live in a state like California that's coming down with all these draconian measures right. for homeowners, you obviously want to be a renter. Yeah. And oh. if, you, if you are a, a, a homeowner, you want to hit the bid yeah. as fast as you can while you can, while you can get out. I mean, uh, and so I think that's the main takeaway with these yeah. slides. It, it, hopefully people will kind of connect the dots there. Yeah, yeah. And so basically, one of the things we're talking about is, you know, some some might be asking, well, why are you talking about California? And we won't be talking about that for very long. So just bear with us for a moment. But understand yeah. this, California is the most populous state in the US. If it were a country, it would have, I think, the sixth largest economy in the world. 
it's yeah. very significant and it is very mismanaged and it is a proxy for the same kind of stuff that's happening in New York. It's happening in Illinois. It's happening in a lot of other states that aren't as big. So they're not talked about, but right. this is an important thing um, to, you know, just understand what's going on there because it's not just when we say California, we're not just talking about California. We're right. talking about, you know, there's an old saying uh, from the olden days, as goes California, so goes the rest of the U.S., right? Yeah, I was and, just going to say, we're talking about the future. Right. Yeah, 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 we are. We are. And by the way, George, I just want to say, you know, on the screen, it, it was great to have you speak at our uh, Meet the Masters of Income property event recently with with Harry Dent and Ken McElroy and Sharon Lecter. Uh, it was just phenomenal. All of our clients loved having you there. Um, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us for that. Sure. Uh, understand that the U.S. is a very big market. Uh, there are 392 MSAs, or mm -hmm. Metropolitan Statistical Areas. And right. uh, inside of those, there are a whole bunch of markets. So you can never stereotype the U.S. real estate market into one thing. Uh, there are over 3,000 counties in the U.S., and within mm -hmm. each of those counties, you have submarkets. So just understand it's a very large country, uh, a lot to look at. Um, renters, I know we wanted to talk about that a little bit and we'll get to your California tax in a moment here. Um, what's interesting about this chart is that if you look at the age group of renters, it has been increasing and it will continue to increase into the future. We've heard about the graying of America uh, and, and we also are seeing there's a graying of the renter pool. Well, what does this mean to us as investors? What does it mean to the overall economy? Good question. Um, what it means is that landlords, I think, in the future will be able to enjoy a much larger tenant base and much larger pool of renters and a more responsible, older pool of renters that are just more reliable. They're not as destructive, um, just a better class of tenants. Uh, as the renter pool ages. And there's no longer the stigma of, uh, you know, being a renter in old age. In fact, it offers a lot of benefits, a lot of flexibility. Uh, you know, people can live where they want. They can try different locations. They can move to tax-friendly locations. Um, you know, they can do what you're doing. You're, you're kind of doing a little bit of the digital nomad life. You're, you've, you know, lived in a few different countries and, and you're enjoying that and you're learning a lot and meeting a lot of new people. That's a great experience. And it just gives you a lot more flexibility. But looking yeah. at the chart here, we can see that Back in just 2007, there were only 6.6 .6 million renters over the age of 60. And wow. now there are over 10 million renters over the age of 60. And by 2035, there will be almost 20 million renters over the age of 60. Now, the overall renter pool grows significantly. For, about, for uh, every 1% decline in homeownership rates, that increases the size of the renter pool by about 1 million people. Hmm. Just sit with that for a moment. And I, I'm the only person in real estate who has said that I think the homeownership rate is way too high, okay? It really should be about 50 to 55% in my opinion. That's the right number. Um, well, the healthy number. Just the healthy clarify. number, yeah. The, the healthy, healthy number, number without the subsidies from Fannie and Freddie. Exactly. And it'd probably be lower than that without those subsidies. But uh, but anyway, that's a long discussion. Here is the California thing. And you had him on your show. And, and so did I. Uh, that's yeah. good old Peter. I think I'm talking to Peter on uh, Monday. Actually, yeah. I'm yeah. on Monday. Good stuff. Well, I mean, look at this, you know, he, he tweeted and he said, California proposed a point a point four percent annual wealth tax. Now, Understand, wow. folks, what a wealth tax is. A wealth tax is not an income tax. You could be making zero income every year. But if you have a million dollars in the bank, the government is going to come along and take $40,000 of that money every year. Let, let me throw in something there real quick, Jason. That would be, I think, a best case scenario. Let's say you've got a business <laughs> worth a million dollars, yeah. like a Subway franchise. You could be or, forced to liquidate it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's my, yeah. That was my point yeah. there. 
This is very scary stuff. This is what happens with estate taxes. It forces uh, heirs to uh, to liquidate the assets of the estate when their when their parents pass away, for example, because mm. they've got to liquidate it just to pay the tax. So right. they're basically forced into a position where it may not be the right time to sell the asset. They may not want to sell the asset. Maybe they have all kinds of liquidity for the asset. And you got to take a massive haircut like that subway <sighs> franchise. I mean, who, you're going to sell that in two days. Yeah. That's going to take you two years to sell the thing. Yeah. And then because you owe 40 grand in taxes, let's say. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very destructive to the economy. You know, all those people that were being employed by that business could lose their jobs it's a disaster. This is an absolute disaster. So and what's but, super scary is, it, is it's retroactive. I know, which I think is unconstitutional, but maybe not. I don't, they'll find a way. So here, here's what they're saying. That would, this would apply to former residents. And wow. this goes back to what I was calling, George, the economic Berlin Wall. Now, Folks, I've been to Berlin a few times. It's a great city, Berlin, Germany. I, I was actually born in Europe, uh, but I've been to Berlin a couple of times. And the first time I went to Berlin in the early 90s, right after the wall fell, um, you know, I learned about the story of the Berlin Wall, which they basically erected a Berlin Wall in a weekend. And they did this to stop the brain drain as everybody was leaving East Berlin and going to the West for better opportunities, they yeah. thought there is a brain drain. We've got to force these people to stay here as prisoners they, they against their will. For their protection. Yeah, of course. It's always That's for our they protection. Sold they sold it as your protection. We have all these spies coming in from the West. So we're going to protect you by building this wall. Yeah. Yeah. So they built the wall in a weekend and everybody became a prisoner of Berlin. Well, California is attempting to do that with economics and make yeah. it impossible for... Now, I left California in 2011, nine years ago. This could apply say, to me. Might. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say. <laughs> I know, I know. They might say, you know, you were here in 2010 and 2011, uh, so you owe us taxes. I, I, I cannot believe it. It's absolutely shocking. Yeah, and you'd have to pay that on all your property. I mean, I don't know how many properties you have, but you... I, I mean... I don't know. That, that's going to be a big number, 0.4% if you combined everything, that the value of everything you own, because you'd have to go in and it, well, maybe not. I was going to say, is it based on your equity or is it based on uh, the assets you control? Who knows? It would likely be based on equity, which is a little bit better. But, you know, remember, I have businesses in California too, even now. Okay. Um, yeah. So this state, just gets their claws in you. And, and folks, this is not just about this state. It's about any government anywhere in the world that is desperate for money. Okay. Yeah. This is the, the lesson. So yeah. anyway, um, here's an interesting thing. Median mortgage payments and rents as a percentage of median income. This is a fascinating chart. Now it only goes up yeah. to 2016. I wish I had it up to, you know, present day, but it just shows you, George, how over time since 1979, and one of the great things you do is you look at long periods of history on your show, and that's what I love about your content. You look at big spans so we can have context. And here you can see how this divergence has happened, how at times in history, it's been a better deal to be a renter, and at times it's been a better deal to be a homeowner. Okay. Mm -hmm. But now uh, this has diverged even more since this chart ended in 2016, where it shows that the median mortgage payment versus median income has declined, but the median rent payment versus income has increased dramatically. Right. And that means landlords are in a very favorable position. Okay. This is a, a landlord's market for sure. So I mean, they got yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll stop sharing this for a moment. Uh, and I, I want to just show you something. Um, and I'll just hold it up in front of the camera. Uh, you talk a lot about inflation, George. And I talk about something I call packaged commodities investing. Yeah. And one of our clients sent this report, the lumber market report. Now, yeah, of course, you know who you should talk to? You should talk to the uneducated economists. 
Re remind me when we get done because okay. he focuses on this stuff. He's a good okay. buddy. Of mine. Anyway, keep going. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so you know, I talk about this packaged commodities investing. How when we buy a house we're really buying the commodities, the ingredients, the lumber, the concrete, the glass, the steel, the copper wire, the petroleum products, the labor, the energy it consumes to build the house. All of these ingredients, right? You look around my house, you see ingredients. They're just assembled or packaged, if you will, in the form of a house. So lumber is one of the big ingredients uh, for a house. And one of our clients uh, is in the lumber industry and sent me this internal newsletter called the Lumber Market Report. So here it says, framing lumber prices climbed further into record territory as acute supply scarcities remained in effect. Frustrations mounted for many buyers of lumber, okay, uh, who, who continued to struggle to cover immediate needs. Recent lumber production statistics put imbalance between supplies and demand in clearer focus. Check this out. George, you talk a lot about how there's inflation hidden in the system that we haven't seen yet, right? Well, here's just yet another example of it, okay? Due to supply shocks often too, yeah. Supply and demand and shock. Supply yeah. Supply shocks, yeah. Yeah, it says through May, Canadian production, now a lot of lumber comes from Canada. Um, uh, through May, Canadian production was running 15.9% behind the same period a year ago with British Columbia down 25.2% year over year. And it just goes on and he even circled the stuff to just talk about how there's this incredible shortage and prices are going up. One of our providers that sells uh, rental homes to our investor clients yeah. just last week had to raise the price of all these houses by $2,000 because the building materials cost has increased so much. Mm, wow. Yeah. So where are mortgage rates right now in the U S oh, for, for 30 year fixed? Incredibly cheap. One big lender just announced uh, for now, this is owner occupied mortgages. Investors don't get these rates. Okay. They're, they're right. a little higher for investors, but for owner occupied, because that's the only one that really has a good index. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're sitting down. I hope your uh, viewers and listeners are sitting down 1.99% 30 year fixed rate loan. You're literally getting paid to borrow. George, what do you think the real inflation rate is right now? Yeah. <laughs> Trick question, I mean, right? <laughs> yeah, I, say, I mean, as, as far as the stuff people are buying on a daily basis, yeah, like that's the, your the crux of your question. Yeah, it's got to be five to ten percent. So, if you borrow money at two percent, and you have inflation of say just five percent, let's be conservative. You're getting literally paid three percent to borrow the money, not including the tax write-off that you get for paying the interest on that money. So yeah. if you're in a, say you're in a, a terrible state, right, where you're paying a combined state and federal tax rate of 50%, just for round numbers sake, you know, it might not be that high, but let's just go with that for round numbers. So you're really paying 1% interest, not 2% interest, because half of it is deductible. So you're getting paid 4% a year to borrow the money if you never rent that property out. It's yeah. amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. And, and then you got to, I would try to uh, nail it down a little further and try to figure out how much the has, have prices, have rents increased per annum on average going back to call it 2000. I mean, yeah. do we, uh, what have they increased? Maybe, I mean, three, four, five percent. Uh, well, yeah, typically it's uh, about three percent per year. A, for a real estate investor, that's the key metric. Right. It's not just inflation. It's, sure. it's rent inflation because right. that's what you're using to pay that mortgage down mm -hmm. with. So, yep. so that, that's where you got to look at the delta as between the increase in rents and the interest rate that you're paying on the debt. But the, the, the bottom line is uh, – that, that's just crazy. 1.99%. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Owner occupied. And, um, and get this, you're going to love this one, George. 
if uh, you talk a lot about, uh, you know, you do some great videos on how there is another crisis looming, right? And one of the, you know, the things that we're all thinking about, because it was the basically the cause of the Great Recession, you know, 12 years ago, uh, is, is what is going on in the mortgage market? Are these loans safe or are they toxic, right? And, you know, in fairness to the banks, you know, they've been pretty darn conservative, I think over con too conservative in many ways on the mortgage side. Now, student loans, auto loans, credit card, that's a whole different disaster, okay? But on the mortgages, the banks have, I think, overcorrected, frankly. They've been a little too conservative. I think that's just on the margin. And the reason, because I've looked at the, uh, the down payment data, and the down payment, as far as it's, it's very, very low, as far as the percentage, it's just as low as it was back in 2005, 2006. So yeah. on the margin, I'm not saying that there are these big liar loans like we had there. Yeah. It's definitely different, but the bulk of it, I think is, 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 is very consistent. But anyway, anyway. Sure. This yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and, you know, one of the reasons what you just said is very, very important is that um, if people have low down payments, they don't have a lot of skin in the game. And if they don't have a lot of skin in the game, they just walk, you know, yeah, right. and, and, you know, you got to have people be at stake. There's a, a biblical concept that's really important. It's that where, where it, they talk in scripture about being equally yoked. Okay. And they, they talk about that in the context of marriage. Okay. That the husband and wife should be equally yoked. Right. Um, and, but you know, the borrower and the lender should be equally yoked, right. Where the borrowers got some stake in the, in the whole thing, by the way, I don't know if you've interviewed him, but he'd be a great interview. Nicholas, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb or N Nicholas. Nassim. Oh yeah. I, I have love his books. He's, he's brilliant. And, um, his, his book skin in the game is fantastic. Yeah. So what are you seeing going on with RV ratios? Rent to value ratios? Yeah. And, um, and, and linear markets that we like. I mean, is that... Rent to value ratios definitely declining. It's, it's yeah. very hard to get a good quality property and get a 1% rent to value ratio. But I did a podcast recently on how the rent to value ratio has been repealed now, I don't completely believe that, but for headlines' sake and clickbait, I kind of thought it was pretty good. Uh, so, focus on positive cash flow now with those mortgage rates at one point nine nine percent, you got to factor that into the equation because at the end of the day, it's all about positive cash flow. Exactly, exactly, because the Gammon, the George Gammon definition of an investment is something that pays you. That's an right. investment in in your eyes, and I love that that definition that you have. Uh, so, you really don't need. Uh, to get a 1% rent to value ratio to have a fantastic investment now because these mortgage rates are so low that, you know, your, your payment has just dropped considerably. Let me show you something, by the way. I'll, I'll what just... numbers are you seeing that, were, that still pencil out as far as an RV ratio? Um, oh, you can pencil at 0.6%, 0.7%, wow. you know, really wow. quite nicely. It's, it's pretty amazing. Let me just show you a couple things here on the screen. Um, this one is... Um, the S&P 500, which of course is a ridiculous money pump game, you know, <laughs> it's a whole nother conversation. But what's interesting about this is when you ask yourself the question compared to what, look at the builder, the home builder stocks compared to the broader S&P. And they are, they are exceeding the S&P by a wide, wide margin. Um, that's pretty that's a sign of a lot of home builder optimism okay so take it for what it's worth just wanted to mention it um here is the pending home sale index published by nar the national association of realtors uh and it shows you in 2020 it's like a hockey stick as soon as april hit demand just skyrocketed and everybody wants to reposition themselves to get out of those dangerous, densely populated, race riot torn urban areas and get into a nice safe suburb where you can socially distance, where you don't need to worry about, uh, you know, a bunch of lunatic rioters, where you don't have some idiotic left wing mayor that won't, you know, enforce the laws. I mean, th these mayors of these cities should be put in prison that, you know, they have a duty to protect the public and, and they're just not doing their job. It's, it's absolutely 
terrible what's happening. So home sales have been skyrocketing. It's amazing. And but, but if, is that, can go you ahead. go back to that? Yeah. So here's the, is the pending home sale surge a result of more deals being done or is it a result of the lockdowns increasing the amount of deals that are actually pending because they can't go through at the sale so they have to extend it further? Well, the pending home sale index, as I understand it, it only counts the number of deals that went under contract, which, okay. see, one of the, here, that's an important point you raise. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. One of the problems with real estate statistics is they're always 60 to 90 days behind. They have a big time lag. So, Many years ago, NAR came out with a pending home sales index where they could simply look at the MLS system, uh, all of the MLS systems across the country, and they could say, okay, this property was available and now it went under contract. It's reported as pending. And it might take 30, 60 days to close the deal, but we don't care. We're just counting that it became a pending sale. So now we have more real-time information as to what the pulse is on the market. See, with the stock market, you get data in real time. You know if the s and is up or down uh, instantaneously. Right. With real estate, you've got to wait for the house to sell, the deal to close, the deed to get recorded, and then the recording data to be all parsed and assimilated and aggregated and published. So the pending home sales gives you a pulse of what's going on in a much more real time fashion. Right. But, but my point is if there, if a house goes into pending and the closing date gets extended, let's say a month, two months, three months, then it, then it is still a pending sale. Right? Yeah. That, that's so not what it is. Yeah, that's not what it is. No, that would be very, very misleading if it were that way. Okay. Because okay. a new construction home could take a year to close or, you know, six months, right? Okay. So, so it, it only counts, you know, th th here's the properties for sale in this bucket. And yep. now they went pending. How many went pending last week? How many went pending, you know, the week before? How many went pending? out of the pending bucket, they got to close. Right. And some don't close. In, in fairness, right, you know, some are, are we seeing more not close? Not that they're not going to close in the future, but the close is being delayed because of uh, the virus or the lockdowns, and therefore you're getting more and more uh, sales go into the the pending bucket that otherwise would have left the pending bucket into the close bucket. We are not seeing, and this is anecdotal, of course. We are not seeing. Uh, transactions being delayed because of uh, the virus. Okay. We are seeing transactions being delayed because of an effect of the virus, which is the incredibly low interest rates uh, that are clogging up the system where the whole country is trying to refinance their mortgage and everybody's wow. trying to buy a house and that's slowing the process down in terms of mortgage processing. That is what's yeah. happening. Got it. Got it. But I, I think I was trying to get into some pretty heavy duty nuance there, but I think at, at, at the, the bulk of this rise is, is most likely demand. I mean, to your point, like yeah. I'm trying to split hairs there. Okay. One, one other important thing that I kind of thought you were alluding to when you first asked that question is that, um, you know, it's a kind of, it's kind of a supply demand shock thing, right? Because, during the first part of the quarantines, uh, everything just kind of shut down. Yeah, right. And so usually, you your house, even if, yeah, right. Usually, there's a big spring selling season. There's, so the spring selling season was postponed, mm -hmm. and when the when the quarantines started to lift, everybody went out and bought. So some of it is pent up demand. So we got to be careful that we don't get too optimistic about this, because. Uh -huh some of it that we're seeing is just demand that, you know, basically went on hold for two to three months. Okay. That, that just has been pushed back a little bit, but I, but I will tell you, um, and, and look at you and I, George, we just look at this stuff all day long. Now you look at the broader stuff than I do because you're looking at the stock market a lot more than I am and, and many other things, but you know, I'm looking at the housing market constantly. I, I look at charts and graphs, you know, for, 
an hour and a half every day. I mean, that's my life and I love it. It's super interesting. And my sense of it, just my, my take it, trying yeah. to assimilate all this stuff is yeah. that we have a pretty good road ahead for very strong home sales in suburban and even rural markets. And by the way, I have another chart that I don't have ready to show you, but I can look for it, uh, depending on, you know, if you, if you do a little talking, I can find it pretty quickly. Uh, that'll show you what's happened in rural and suburban markets compared to urban markets. And th the whole economy and the whole housing market doesn't need to hold up for a smart investor to make a lot of money right now. All that has to happen is they just have to be, you know, they have to skate to where the puck is going. And the puck right. is going to suburban and urban markets. Or, uh, not, or sorry, suburban and rural markets. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So one thing I can tell you if you want to look at that chart is just a, a conversation I had with uh, a guy here on St. Bart's at, a, at one of these dinner oh, yeah. parties I went to, the hedge fund manager. It wasn't Hugh, it was another guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has a place in Tahoe, if my memory serves me right. Yep. And it's one of these big resort places, you know, houses on the uh, on the lake or something like that. And he said that it's been for sale for like five years. Wow. And it was just kind of one of these very unique properties that was worth a lot of money. And he just wasn't really willing to drop his price too much. Mm -hmm. And he said, just as of the last like month and a half. Snapped up. Yeah, the real estate agents just calling him saying, we've got another showing, we've got another showing, yeah. we've got another showing, we've got another showing. And he said he just, he sold it, uh, you know, he finally got the deal closed. But he said he saw just an, a massive increase in the amount of showing. I mean, he said he'd go like a year yeah. and it wouldn't even get shown. So here's, of, here's the reason. Here's the reason. He didn't have to lower his price. Jerome Powell lowered his price by lowering the interest rate and making the house much more affordable than it used to be. That's what well, happened. Yeah, yeah, in that price range, I don't think it was uh, the Jerome Powell effect. <laughs> oh, you, are you kidding me? Hedge fund managers and wealthy people use debt all the time. They, they love getting big mortgages and, and yeah. negative interest rates. <laughs> I mean, I do. <laughs> Maybe, but I, I think the more it was the people wanted to get out of the cities. Oh, the urban areas that yeah and, and get into some place with some space where uh they could get out and get exercise walk their dog and if they go into another lockdown right then they're, they're not stuck in san francisco yeah, or right. yeah uh, that's true you're, you're you're absolutely right about that absolutely right uh i am looking for that other chart uh, but, but that is true. And yes, so, everybody okay, well, is so uh, skittish. Two things at once here, but yeah. if, if, do you have any opinions on the stimulus checks ending and the PPP loans ending and how they, that may affect the overall uh, real estate market and the rental market? Yeah. For people's ability to pay rents? Great question. Um, you know, this may sound imprudent, but, um, I, I really think we can just almost hang our hat on the fact that there's just going to be another program or an extension or an expansion, because I don't think that um, central bankers and government policymakers really feel that there's any real consequences, at least not during their term. And that's part of the problem with our system is that everybody just wants it to be good in during their tenure. And, you know, they don't think long term enough or they don't care. Uh, and so, you know, if inflation happens later, it'll be after I'm out of office. So who cares? Let's spend the money now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely think we're going to see more stimulus and oh, UBI. Yeah. I don't know if it'll be before the election. There might be some gridlock, but I, I think they're going to have to spend the, the TGA, the Treasury General account, or at least a, a, some of the money in there. And that'll be kind of that quantitative easing effect, increasing base money and broad money could give us some more price inflation. But uh, I, I definitely think after, regardless of who's in office, I think there's going to be some sort of more consistent uh, stimulus and whether you want to call that QE for the people or, or UBI or whatever, I, I think yeah. that's 
going to be part of our future. We, we talked about that before, George, and I completely agree with you that, you know, this is all an excuse to really push a universal basic income uh, yeah. or a massive expansion of the Section 8 uh, government housing program. Um, this is just an, a, a way for government to just be much more intrusive, much more involved, to create new regulations, because every government program comes with a whole new set of regulations and control over right. our lives. And so uh, they, they like these because these tethers, uh, all these programs become tethers on us where they get to control us and, um, and, 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 you know, just play their games, right? Well, so, I never thought about it from a standpoint of an expansion of Section 8. Oh, that, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. E e either it'll be Section 8, which is a rental assistance program, or it'll be some new program, you know, but there, the point is, there's just going to be more government. Have, have you heard some political narrative that's been talking about that? Nope. It's just my okay. opinion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, this is just my own, you know, you just know it's coming. You know, whoever doles out the goodies is the one who gets reelected. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> what are you hearing in the States as far as states proposing like a moratorium on rent or rent controls or something like that or are we are you hearing more about that? i'm just trying to have you be yeah. my eyes and ears on the ground there because i spend so little time in the states yeah there's definitely a lot of talk about that kind of stuff but it's mostly in the left-wing areas the business unfriendly okay jurisdictions, the landlord unfriendly jurisdictions, these are the places you don't want to be anyway. Okay. You know, they're, yeah. they're just not, they're just not a good environment. Um, okay. I didn't find the exact chart, Okay, but this one's interesting. Look at this. This is the uh, greatest daily net exodus and gain. And you can just see, and this is only, you know, a few amount of people daily. Yeah. So this, these are people, Coming and going. This is net migration, in or out. Okay, so let me, let me back up on this one a, a moment. This is this is huge. Yeah. Because I've I've always told people that uh, I see that uh, if if rents were to go down, and that that's a big if, but if they were, you would have to have a decrease in population, and yeah. or most likely have a decrease in population in that uh, metro area. Mm -hmm. Or another thing that could happen is the population might not decrease, but the population could get so poor that they move, that more and more people move into the same square footage. Yeah. So instead of having two or three they people. They double up. Yeah. Yeah. Now you got eight people, nine people like yeah. you see in South America. And that, that yeah, the or, or Los Angeles. You see that in Los Angeles all the time. Yeah. So you have the yeah. same effect uh, of a decrease in population, therefore maybe downward pressure on rents. Yep. Yeah. So this is just shouting at me that the last place you would want to own a rental property is in LA, Chicago, and New York. Yeah. You know, right. Net migration yeah. of population. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's huge. Yeah, it's just crazy. It really is. Now, I will say we've done a, a little bit of business in some of the Chicago suburbs to where this doesn't really apply. This is more the city proper. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think some of those are still okay. Now, they still, the problem is they still are in Illinois, unfortunately. But, yeah. you know, Chicago is like the only sort of famous city in America that's actually not that expensive. Um, so it does have some things going for it like that. I, okay. that's, out of all the markets that you're in, that's probably my least favorite. Yeah. I, I yeah. much prefer the, the more just straightforward linear markets. Me too, in the Southeast especially. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, listen, you like Kansas City much more than I do. I'm not that crazy about the yeah, place. That's because but... you can't get a good provider there. I think if yeah. you had a good yeah. provider, a good infrastructure, you'd like a little bit more. Yeah, well, we've had a lot of bad ones there. For some reason, it just, we, we joke about it. We say, what is something in the water in Kansas City that you just have all yeah. these bad people? But you got some good people you work with. Um, but, um, but, you know, the, the, the action is where the sunshine is that's the you yeah. know the, the smile states right if you drew a smile across this map um this is this is where the action is and this stuff's too expensive over here so and now texas has become too expensive a lot of texas what about so san antonio it's better but it's still gotten it's getting texas Get has been getting kind of expensive you know florida is really where the action is now florida yeah. and atlanta is okay too so so that's one chart let me show you another thing 
Okay. Okay. So you talk about inflation. I thought you'd like this. This is a real life example from my own life. Okay. I bought, <laughs> I bought this table. This is my Amazon order. I bought this table on August 1st of 2018. And Carrie Lutz, who you know is a mutual friend yeah. of ours, he yeah. borrowed it from me and he hasn't given it back. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, yeah. I'll just give it to him and I'll just buy another one. It was only $34. Right. But guess what? Now that same table is $70. It's huh. doubled in price, George. In just a couple of years. In two years. This is yeah. an, a total example. Like, this is the inflation nobody's counting. Yeah. This table is not in the consumer price index, but it's real because I want to buy it. Yeah. 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 So thought you'd like that. Uncle Jerome Powell. Let's talk about him before we wrap up. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as much as we love, love to hate this guy because he is a Keynesian uh, for sure, but, you know, he has given us investors a big gift. Okay. And, you know, I'm not like, giving them a compliment. I'm sort of being sarcastic about that, right? But, uh, but whatever. Anyway, look at the payment of the house payment as a percentage of income. Mm. Okay. Look at this. February 2017 on up to February 2018. I wish I had the chart that went up to yeah. the present day. It's, you know, this is the problem with these damn charts. They're all different time periods and you can never get them uh, totally complete. But, but just notice here, folks, how the payment in June of 2017 as a percentage of income was mm -hmm. much higher than it was in, now it's much lower now. If you extended this chart, it'd be really low now, okay? Oh, shockingly, um, Jason, I don't know if you've heard any of my talks with Lynn Alden lately, yep. but she pointed out that the incomes in the United States on average have gone up, yeah. up the last couple months due to all these stimulus checks and sure. extended unemployment and whatnot, while the, while the unemployment rate is up you know, over 10%, yeah. incomes have gone up. So if you're telling me that mortgage rates are sub 2%, and I know from Lynn's work that incomes are up, I, can, I mean, I can't even imagine what that chart would look like now. This is the moral hazard of why people won't come back to work. Why should yeah. they? It's better to yeah. stay home and watch Netflix than to go back to your low wage job because you're literally making more money staying at home. So yeah. it's, a, it's a huge moral hazard. But you know, let me mention another thing and I don't have any data on this. It's just, you know, it's just something I've observed and maybe you have too. But you know, uh, there are some definite good things coming out of this whole pandemic. And you know, one more of them amongst many others, uh, of, including creative destruction and, and all sorts of good reworking of business and life in many ways that are they're very positive. A lot of people, George, are sitting at home and they are learning new skills. You know, they are learning how to program. They're learning how to code. They're learning how to do all sorts of stuff, how to start a home-based business. And, you know, we haven't seen any benefit of that. Now, granted, there's a whole other segment of the population that's just becoming losers and couch potatoes. Uh, but, but some people are using this time productively. And, you know, they're finally getting time to improve themselves and yeah. further their education that they didn't have time to do before. So, it's, it's, you know, that, that'll have a good impact on the economy. At, you know, in the future. Yeah, I, I just, I wish there was more creative destruction with the big corporations uh, yeah. instead of the, the ma, mom and pop yeah. shop on the corner. I, I, I agree. I uh, Schumpeter would be allowed to grab hold of uh, things like Hertz and American yeah. Airlines. Oh. And yeah, I agree. The, and uh, and how, about, how about Goldman uh, Sachs too? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, there's, there's no startup culture in these big companies that get bailouts and, and all sorts of Cantillian effect government favoritism, uh, because they don't get destroyed. You know, they and the small businesses do get destroyed and they have to reinvent themselves. So they're much more nimble. But these big companies aren't for you know, why isn't JP Morgan Chase forced to reinvent itself? You know, they they're, they're, they're just terrible. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they just fun back AIG. I mean, any yeah, of them, it's, yeah, it's I know. just like Japan with the zombie corporations. Yeah. All right, man, I know you're short on time. So 
for my viewers who want to find out more about what you do and the linear markets and any questions they have about real estate investing or just the real estate market in general, where can they go to find that out? Of course, jasonhartman.com, jasonhartman.com. And by the way, I think we have uh, the pandemic investing book up at jasonhartman.com slash George. I, I think that link works. Uh, and uh, and that's uh, for, for your people uh, to get the free book. And um, I just wanted to also show you this one more thing on the screen. Yeah, 2006, sure. 2006, $100,000 mortgage was $626 a month. Yeah. In 2020, you get a hundred and seventy thousand dollar mortgage for a dollar more per month. Yeah, <laughs> that's the seventy percent uh, discount that Uncle Jerome Powell, our rich uncle, gave us. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know whether that stat makes me laugh or cry. But and it's right. <laughs> it's mixed. I, I'll be the first to agree with you, but uh, you know the point is, look, you know the powers that be are screwing the economy in a lot of ways. Let's take what we can and use it to further sure. our own wealth and future. And, you know, you're, you, we're not going to change it. Okay. It's just the way it is. Um, well, Jason, we got to build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments. Right? I think I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. All right, man. Have a great day. We'll do it again soon. All right, George. Thanks a lot. Happy investing to you and your viewers.